Next, we pivot to our second group of biomolecules, the lipids. Lipids do not form true polymers. Lipids are hydrophobic because they are mostly nonpolar hydrocarbons. Included among the lipids are fats, phospholipids, and steroids. At least those are the ones I'm going to tell you about. Notice the pancakes are in the background again. While the cakes themselves are mostly complex carbohydrate, starch, and the syrup is delicious simple carbohydrate, sugar, the pat of butter up on top is straight up lipid, specifically fat. Oh, hydrophobic fats. Fats are also known as triglycerides and are made of glycerol and fatty acids. Fatty acids are made up of hydrocarbons with a carboxyl functional group at one end, thus acids. Here we see a fat being produced. On the left side, in the gray shape here, is glycerol, which is a three carbon alcohol with three hydroxyl groups. Those hydroxyl groups are a place for attachment of the yellow things, which are the fatty acids. As you can see, the carboxyl group of the fatty acid backs it on up to the hydroxyl group, and the OH in the carboxyl combines with the H on the glycerol hydroxyl, and kaboom! One dehydration reaction later, you've got a water molecule released and an ester linkage between the fatty acid and the glycerol molecule. Two more hydration reactions and boom, boom, you've got a triglyceride, also known as a fat. Fats vary in the fatty acids that make them up. The glycerol doesn't change, but there are a couple of important variables that affect the composition of fatty acids. One is the length of the hydrocarbon chain, and the other is the presence and location of double bonds. Double bonds? Do I intuit that your ears pricked up when I said that? Double bonds? How about now? Are your ears pricking up yet? Now? Remember how double bonds have a very special type of isomerization? We did a little dance about this. Cis-trans isomers, and yes, that is important, wink. So saturated fatty acids are saturated with hydrogens. They have no double bonds. Unsaturated fatty acids have double bonds. The length of the chains in the number and quality of the double bonds affects the physical properties of the fats they'll produce. Longer carbon chains and no double bonds means the fat will be solid at a higher temperature. Think butter. Shorter carbon chains and fatty acids with one or more double bonds will be liquid to a lower temperature. Think vegetable oil. If a fat has saturated fatty acids, the result is a saturated fat. Again, saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Or should I say, temperature. Common dietary animal fats are saturated. Unsaturated fats have unsaturated fatty acids, which are usually liquid at room temperature. And these include vegetable oils and fish fats. Fat is usually considered to be one of the worst F words around. One reason for this is the association between a fatty diet, particularly a diet rich in saturated fats, and heart disease. However, an even greater threat to heart health comes from trans fats. Artificial hydrogenation of unsaturated fats adds hydrogens to carbons in a double bond and produces saturated fats. When vegetable oils are hydrogenated, this can also lead to the double bonds being isomerized from cis isomers to trans isomers. Remember cis, cis, trans, trans, trans? This is done for a couple of reasons, this artificial hydrogenation. Partially hydrogenated oils don't spoil as quickly. It gives them shelf life. And two, hydrogenated oils are solid at higher temperatures, which changes their properties when cooking, and that's often more desirable. 
Unfortunately, there is a three, a third reason for partial hydrogenation. Well, it's not really a reason, it's more an effect. Trans fats, as you can see in the illustration, lie flatter in three dimensions compared to cis isomers, which have a kink in that uh, hydrocarbon tail. And that lying flatter contributes more risk to cardiovas developing cardiovascular disease than natural saturated fats. And this is why we see zero grams trans fat on food packaging nowadays, because we're trying to get rid of it because of its increased risk of, of contributing to heart disease. So trans fats are considered to be bad fats. In contrast with trans fats, there are the so-called good fats, including those with omega-3 fatty acids. We cannot produce these on our own, so they must be eaten as part of our diet. Omega-3 fatty acids are associated with a decreased risk in developing cardiovascular disease, such as heart attack and stroke. They get their name from the position of the unsaturations, or the double bonds. The carbon in the carbon carboxyl functional group is called the alpha carbon, because alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. While the length of these hydrocarbon chains may vary, 18, 20, or 22, the double bond in these fatty acids is three carbons from the tail end. Since omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the double bond is three back from the omega carbon. One, two, three, double bond. One, two, three, double bond. One, two, three, double bond. And then we have linolenic and arachidonic acids, which are omega-6 fatty acid. Fat <laughs> omega-6 fatty acids. One, two, three, four, five, six, double bond. Avocados are rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, or MUFAs, which are thought to be a good fat, though any diet that is rich in fats may present health problems. Again, fat is thought of as being bad, bad, bad. However, fats are a normal and typical biological molecule, and they have important functions. The main function is for long-term energy storage. We saw earlier how animals can use glucose for fuel, or they can cycle excess glucose into glycogen in the liver and muscles. If we store up a lot of glycogen, it will be put into deep storage as fat. In case we totally run out of carbohydrate fuel sources, adipose, or fatty tissue, can serve as fuel. Though, as you probably know, the body does not surrender those fat reserves easily. Adipose tissue is important for cushioning the organs and for insulation. If animals of the Arctic, such as whales, bears, and walruses, don't store enough fat in the short summer, they risk death over the long winter. Calorie for calorie, fat stores a lot of joules of potential energy. For this reason, plants produce fats most frequently in seeds. Cottonseed oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, peanut oil, these are all produced from crushing seeds. The oils are in there, which serve as an energy source for the baby plant in the seed before it can photosynthesize and produce its own energy. A similar type of molecule with a different function is the phospholipid. Same fatty acids, same glycerol holding them together, but the third hydroxyl group is bonded to a phosphate group instead of a fatty acid number three. The fatty acids are hydrophobic, of course, but if you remember the structure of the phosphate group, it's kind of crazy polar and hydrophilic. So the resulting molecule is part hydrophilic part hydrophobic, and together we call the whole molecule amphipathic to reflect that, being both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. There's a good functional reason for this loopy molecule that can't decide whether it loves or hates water. In these images, you can see that the grayed bit is the hydrophilic portion, and the yellow fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. The fatty acids don't have to be the same fatty acids, as, as you can see here, one is saturated, and the other is an omega-9 cis unsaturated, so it's got a little kink in its tail.
we will see an awful lot of these phospholipids in unit two, drawn as these cartoonish things that remind me of eggs with legs. In the aqueous environment of the cell, all of the hydrophobic ends try to get away from the water and the hydrophilic phosphate groups interact with the water. This leads to the self-assembly of a structure called a phospholipid bilayer, like you can see here. Cells use these bilayers as boundaries, kind of like walls, but we've already seen two other substances in this chapter that we call cell walls, so we don't call the phospholipid bilayer cell walls. Instead, we call them membranes, and we have a whole chapter on membranes in the next unit, chapter eight, uh, seven. Yeah. To bring this half of chapter five to a close, we have one more important type of lipid to know about. These are the steroids. Steroids are a type of hormone or a molecule that can direct major organismal change in low concentrations by triggering cascades of biological rea biochemical reactions. The basic structure of steroids we have already seen in chapter four, although very briefly. Estradiol and testosterone are both steroid hormones associated with vertebrate secondary sexual characteristics. Notice how both of these molecules have the same underlying four ring structure. When you see that yellow shape, think steroid. How does it relate to the fats and phospholipids that we've seen? Well, they're largely hydrocarbon, or I like to think of it kind of like a molecular balloon animal made by bending a long chain of carbons into this shape. While they often have some polar functional groups attached to them, these polar functional groups don't pull enough electron density away to make these molecules water soluble. Kind of like attaching a ping pong ball to a cinder block. It's not going to float the cinder block if you hold, throw the whole thing into a lake. Cholesterol is an important animal steroid, and you've probably heard that too much cholesterol is also not good for your cardiovascular health. You need cholesterol, but the typical American gets more than enough from their diet to supplement what our own bodies produce. This brings us to the end of the first half of chapter five, and we will pick up with proteins in the next bit.